this is Mark Sobel. I'm the U.S. Chair of OMFIF, and today I have the distinct uh, privilege and honor to be joined by Henry Paulson. After a career at Goldman Sachs, uh, Secretary Paulson led the Treasury from July 2006 through January 2009. He was the 74th Secretary of the Treasury and of our nation. Um, he he got to hold the reins in a very tumultuous period in American economic and financial life and history is going to record him very favorably for his stewardship. Um, based on my reflections of your time at Treasury, there were three themes for me that stood out that might provide fertile grounds for a discussion today. Uh, one is China. Um, second is the financial crisis and the U.S. economy. And third, uh, your passion for the environment. Um, and of course, you're heading up the Paulson Institute now, which is very much focused on uh, your vision of fostering a U.S.-China relationship that serves to maintain global order in a, evolving, a rapidly evolving world. So welcome, and again, thank you for joining uh, me today. Well, well Mark, it, it's great to be here. You know, one of the real pleasures of working at Treasury was that there was just a great great senior staff of economic professionals. And you are among the very best. And I really enjoyed working with you when I was a treasury. And it's uh, great to be talking with you today. Well, thank you. Those are very enheartening words for me to hear. Um, so as I, so let's, let's get into some questions. Um, but let me preface it by saying that uh, in 2007, you twice sent me up to Capitol Hill to testify on the administration's views on the RMB. It wasn't uh, a love fest. Uh, I was not warmly received up there. So I wanted to tell you that I'm going to be a kinder and gentler questioner today than that to which you had me subjected. <laughs> That's a low bar to get over. <laughs> So at Treasury and the Paulson Institute, you've quickly argued that the U.S.-China relationship will be a defining force for the 21st century. At Treasury, you launched the Strategic Economic Dialogue, which was really a whole of government to government um, uh, process of very deep engagement to get the U.S. and China to really know each other better. And you were very successful in that, in bringing us together. But now, the U.S. and China are at loggerheads. There's talk of a Cold War, a new Iron Curtain, decoupling, splinternet. China's seen in the U.S. now not as a responsible stakeholder, but as a strategic competitor. So how worried are you about the current situation? How do you see the relationship moving forward? Is engagement still the right path? Well, there's a lot in that question, Mark. But to begin with, yeah, I'm, I'm quite worried, uh, number one. But just to turn the clock back a bit, when I'd come to Treasury, I re really believed that, uh, that the U.S.-China uh, relationship would be the defining geopolitical uh, issue of, of, of this century. Uh, and I knew it was going to be a difficult issue. And we set up the, the dialogue, the SED was set up because I had seen a, a bunch of uh, of separate dialogues throughout government. I don't, didn't think they were very effective at getting the results we needed from, from China. So we designed the SED so that it would work to be effective within uh, the, the Chinese governmental structure. And, uh, and it w wasn't just uh, talking, it was, it was focused on deliverables. You know, we're looking at long-term issues, but immediate results. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on history, but as you said, one of the big issues d during those days was the currency, right? Currency was a big one. Another big issue was the imbalances. China saved so much more than they consumed. This represented that imbalance was 10% of their GDP. It was huge. We focused on those two hard and we got results. They moved the currency. No one today is arguing the currency. and No one with any rationale is, is arguing that the, that they're doing anything other than holding the value of the currency up. And the imbalances aren't, aren't there anymore. And, you know, we focused on some other tr tr tremendous, uh, um, important issues at the time. Uh, 
product uh, safety, food safety, put in place the 10 year framework and energy and the environment. We only had a year before the financial crisis hit. And the fact that we had those relationships, government to government relations in, in, during the financial crisis, I think the world is a much better place today than it would have been if we hadn't had that. Because, you know, uh, China was very, very helpful uh, as a counterpart during the financial crisis. And then, of course, their stimulus pr program afterwards helped lift the whole world out of a, a recession. But today, uh, this is a relationship. It's, it's a very different China, different U.S., different world. This uh, relationship is spinning in, in some ways out of control. The pandemic has, you know, it is also accelerated that uh, that downward spiral. And so I, I think what's really needed today is, well, well, first of all, we need to recognize the reality that, that China is a strategic competitor. They are an adversary in certain areas, you know, a competitor in many areas. And then we have some sh shared uh, interests, which are, are, are very important to the US, to China, and to the world. And so we, we need a new framework for managing this relationship and one that, uh, that, that recognizes that, that, that there are going to be conflicts and there are going to be serious differences. We need to identify those. We need to manage them in a way that they don't spin out of control. At the same time, we find a ways to build on our common interests uh, or, or the world's going to be a very dangerous place. It's going to be a major challenge, um, a new framework. That, would be, that will be interesting and to see how um, what that might look like or uh, what might come out of, of that. Um, how much of the current tension is due to politics, personalities? How much because of underlying secular forces? Uh, picking up on what you just said, can we get back to some kind of constructive engagement um, in, a, in a new framework? And if you had any thoughts on what that might look like, I'd be curious. Um, and how would that, how different would that be than during your treasury period? And you've alluded to this. I mean, it, it's a very different China today than it was back then, but uh, did, you, could, you, can only, um, you can only act upon what you knew at the time, but uh, are there assumptions that uh, you made then that you, in hindsight, think might you might question today okay well you, you've got a lot uh, packed into that uh, into that question so let's say I would say that part of this is related to personalities uh, some of it to politics uh, and, and and a lot of it to structural issues and so let, let's start with the uh, personalities. Xi Jinping, the, the current uh, chairman of the, of the Communist Party and, and the uh, president of China, has broken the mold in terms of Chinese leadership. So I think he's, uh, he, he has surprised uh, people inside China and outside China. He's, uh, in, in the extent to which he has, uh, he, he has amassed power and control quicker than anyone th th that I can think of. Many people say quicker than anyone going back to Doug Chalpin. I, I think it may be quicker than Doug Chalpin. I mean, so he's he, 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 so he's uh, number one. Number number two, he's been he's been very assertive uh, uh, in China. You know, we focused on outside of China, but very assertive in changing things in China, and and, and looking to to change all aspects, many aspects of society and government and so on, and then very assertive outside of China in areas where he's exerting influence in areas and spheres of, of long-term uh, US uh, uh, leadership. The, uh, let, let me give you one example. So let's take the role of the Communist Party. You know, back when I was in Treasury, neither you nor I or anyone thought that, that China was gonna be anything other than a communist country. You know, that, that was, we never believed they were going to be a Jeffersonian democracy or espouse Western values and so on. But, uh, but uh, Zhang Zemin, you know, who was the president then and, 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 and Zhu Anji, let's just talk about Zhang Zemin. He, he looked at the Communist Party as being a big tent, 
okay? And he said, we're going to bring in business leaders and the elite into the Communist Party. It's a big attempt. Xi Jinping uh, turned, the, is, is tur turned the clock back dramatically. He said, the heck with the Communist Party bringing in the elite, the Communist Party is the elite. And rather than bringing in others into the Communist Party, we're going to put the Communist Party into, it, 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 into business, uh, it, into education, into all of the institutions. And a matter of fact, he took it a step further. He said, rather than governing through the state as their predominant uh, uh, governing vehicle, we're going to govern through the Communist Party. And so he's using the party. So that w w was unpredictable, I, I think, inside China and, and outside China. Uh, obviously, politics make a difference and are making a difference. If you, if you look at the United States right now, there are 400 anti-China bills making their way through Congress. You know, I, I remember back in, uh, in after 9-11 and, and all the... Uh, anti-terrorist bills and you know there was uh, there was nowhere near that many so uh, this is uh, so politics is 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 important but then there are uh, structural factors this is a very different china uh, a different united states and a different world that, than the one uh, that existed even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago, or, or, or 12 years ago, um, that there was, if not the expectation, there was a hope that economic linkages would limit or mitigate the security competition we had, you know, the military competition around the world. And exactly the opposite has happened. What's happened is that the security competition is bled into the economic competition, and they become, in many ways, one and the same. Uh, that, uh, and a big part of this has been technology, the rapid advance of technology. And here I'm talking about AI, advanced manufacturing, quantum computing, all these technologies of the future, the, you know, the digi digital highways, the, the, the internet, and, and so on. So th this is really where the economic battle is taking place. Each country is racing to, uh, to develop the new technologies and set the standards of the technologies of, of the future, which is going to underpin the global economy. So there's a massive competition on technology. And, and then there, there are pressures in both countries, but particularly in the US, to sequester technology in order to protect our national security. And although that needs to be done, and is vitally important and, and, and long overdue in certain areas, there's a real danger that we can go so far and go so far that in attempting to hurt China and isolate China, we cut ourselves off from uh, the the, uh, the rest of the world and the global uh, uh, innovation ecosystem and so on. And, and so this is a very complicated, a very important area. And I, you know, I made a speech a couple of years ago where I talked about the danger of another economic iron curtain. Uh, and I, I think we are going to see, uh, and, and there should be an iron curtain. The question is whether it, it is a, a, which I think it should be a small yard and a high fence, okay, as opposed to a big yard with a moat around it. But that's, but, but that's being played out now. Uh, another major stru structural change is uh, the attitude of U.S. business. That, uh, that the business community has been fragmented. And the fact that China has been so slow in opening up their economy to competition, you know, almost 20 years after WTO, has discouraged some companies to the extent to which they have uh, turned from from being uh, wanting to to, uh, to keep working in China positively to uh, to really lobbying 
you know, uh, Congress for more anti-China measures. And China misread this because many U.S. companies, when they were in meeting with Chinese leaders, they were saying, oh, this is wonderful, you're great, etc." And then they'd run back to Congress and say, I can't tell, tell you how bad this situation is. And, uh, and, and part of it are structural changes in China because the, as they become a $13 trillion economy, they are implementing their own regulatory structures, you know, their own anti-monopoly laws and national security laws, which domestic Chinese companies find very, very difficult and hard to adapt to. So there's a lot going on. But to, to get back to, to ending in, in terms of a, a new framework, as I said, both countries are, are very different and they've got evolving interests. And I, I think the Chinese side has got to recognize that what was acceptable to the U.S. when they were, you know, a $200 million economy, maybe even a trillion dollar economy, is no longer acceptable when there are $13 trillion powerhouse exerting influence all around the world. And the U.S. has got to recognize that China is too big to just simply dictate to. The world is not going to be governable unless we find some common ground. And so I think it's very, very hard to find a, a, a common ground given the evolving interests of both countries. But the, the thing that gives me most hope here is that each country needs a stable environment. We each need peace. We each need rules. We need, we need global stability. And, uh, and so we, we have a strong interest in global order. But this is going to, this is, you know, this is going to take time to hammer out. Well, thank you for that very thorough uh, answer. Um, you know, I, I, in listening to uh, your Cold War Iron Curtain metaphors, high fence or moats, um, I, I wonder, uh, which side Europe is going to uh, fall in uh, in that kind well, of world? Well, well I, I would say this. Europe, in my judgment, it, uh, Mark, it's what, what we saw when, when, when I was at Treasury to, to a large extent, uh, what we saw in Europe and, and all around the world. And we were working with our allies and we said, <clears throat> you know, the Chinese have got to move their currency. They've got to open up. Let's put pressure on them. They'd say, way to go, you demand, go do it, you know, we'll be right behind you. And then they were leading trade missions you know, to, to China. So, uh, and here, I, I, I do believe, you know, a, a, a more serious uh, and maybe thoughtful answer to that uh, question is, I think a lot of this is going to be determined by China's foreign policy and their actions coming out of the pandemic. And they, you know, the, the, the virus started in China, they're coming out of it quicker, their economy is doing well. How they behave is gonna make a major difference. And there's, there's a backlash around the world. But I think the one thing I will say is that I spend a lot of time talking with leaders and companies from around the world. And there's no country anywhere that I know of that is looking to decouple completely from the Chinese economy. And so I think the risk is that the advantage we have is working with our allies. That's the way to put pressure on China for change is coming up with ways to work it with our allies. That's a huge asset that the United States has, uh, a huge asset and a huge advantage. But if we go too far and we try to push other countries to do things that are way outside of their economic interest and decouple from an economy which is the second largest economy in the world, the largest manufacturer in the world, the largest trader, in the world, the largest, uh, you know, builder of important parts of infrastructure in the world, a big exporter of capital, that's not going to work. And, and we'll end up isolated in the United States. So I think this is a, this, this is not a Cold War competition with, with, with Russia that, that was 
economically weak and militarily strong. This is a competition with a formidable economic competitor that is integrated into economies all over the world. And we don't have to be afraid of competition. We are strong and we are by far the strongest uh, economy in the world. We have, uh, we have great capacity in, in, in the U.S., but the key to this competition is going to be doing the things that keep the United States strong and make our economy a model to, that others are going to want to emulate and leading around the world. That's going to be the key. We have to be strong economically, diplomatically, and militarily. Well, thank you for that. That's a, a great segue into a currency question I kind of wanted to ask you because I saw your recent foreign policy magazine article where you argue that, um, in essence, that the strength of the dollar or its global financial role relates to the underlying properties and strengths of our economic system. Um, and so I wanted to offer you an opportunity since you and I spent a lot of time on currency issues uh, together at Treasury just to if you offer any thoughts you had from that article but um, in that context might I also ask you to touch on the question of whether you think the widespread use by the U.S. of unilateral I underscore the word unilateral financial sanctions could over the longer haul erode the dollar's uh, global financial standing. Well, Mark, this, this is fun talking with you about currency because you taught me a lot about what, 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 I, what I know about currency. And, and, and there's no one, at least when I was in the U.S. government, that knew more about it and backed it up with, 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 with sound analysis than Mark Sobel. So in terms of currency, as you know, I've always looked at the dollar as being a proxy for the U.S. economic performance and success. And uh, so, so, so number one, I start there. Number two, I think the dollar will be the primary reserve currency based, uh, continue to be based upon uh, the things that we do in the United States of America, as opposed to what, what happens in China or, or in other places. The, um, and, I, I think the key to that is going to be our governance, our government's ability to adapt our economic policies as we come out of the pandemic so that more Americans participate in our economic success. Because our economy has got to work for more Americans, for our government to work. And, and so I think that's going to be very important. And, and of course, it's going to be essential that we maintain our fiscal strength. There's not a single example in the history of any nation that's continued to be a great country if they dissipated their, their, their fiscal discipline and fiscal strength. So that means managing the national debt, but what it really means is uh, dealing with this st structural deficit over a period of time. And we have this big structural deficit that's created by the aging of our society, the entitlements, and a shortage of revenue. So th that's going to be very important. And then as you get to in internationally, which I was just going to, to, to move there, I, I really do think our ability to influence and lead internationally is going to be determined by our are we a success here? Are we an eco economy that people want to emulate? Are we a strong economy? And our ability to lead uh, globally. And th that's going to be, we are going to have to play a role in leading to come up with rules for trade. You know, the WTO is, is basically dysfunctional now. We need a, 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 a system for for rules for trade, for technology standards, for, for, for investment, all of that's going to be important. And now you asked a question about uh, sanctions. Now, you, you and I knew, we, we, we did quite a bit with sanctions when, uh, when I was at Treasury. 
and we knew that by far the most effective sanctions were multilateral. Unilateral sanctions are just more difficult. When you have multilateral sanctions, they're more effective. But the fact that we are not just the primary reserve currency, but we are the only you know, uh, leading reserve currency gives us the ability to have unilateral sanctions and, and to weaponize the dollar. And you know, because you and I have talked about this a lot in the past, that I believe that there's, this is not cost free. Because when you weaponize the dollar and you impose unilateral sanctions, this ma makes it much more likely that not only will your adversaries want to have another major reserve currency, but your allies will. And, and it also increases the likelihood that your allies and adversaries will work together to develop a, another reserve currency. And so we've seen the Europeans right now, this is one of the big things driving the Europeans is they're working to develop another primary reserve currency. So you, yes, there is a cost to weaponizing the dollar and using it to impose unilateral sanctions. But you know, it, it, there's also the fact that we are the primary reserve currency. We have the ability to do this occasionally. Uh, but I don't think it should be the preferred option. And I don't think it should be something that I think many people are rather naive uh, when, when they look at this as a tool. You know, you know what some of the, the costs of some of the other tools are, but this, this is a hidden cost. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, you were commenting on fiscal policy. That's a good uh, way to shift into the U.S. economic uh, situation. Uh, so we face a crisis now, as uh, you did during your Treasury uh, tenure. Uh, but I'd like to ask you about uh, any thoughts you had on the current U.S. situation and the policy response and what more might be needed. And if I could uh, put a finer point on what my, more might be needed, um, we've uh, had a very uh, rapid uh, fiscal response so far. Um, there's going to be a major debate in July about more fiscal support. Uh, that's one issue. Um, then the, the second uh, is uh, on the finer point is just the Fed. Um, they've been exemplary so far, but uh, you know, if you had any thoughts about that and the uh, assertion that was, for example, made by the IMF yesterday that the um, uh, accommodative policies have created a uh, a gap between the fundamentals of the economy and, and markets. Um, and well, I'll, I'll come back to a, a, a narrow financial regulatory question in a minute, please. Wow. Well, so I'll, I'll do my best to brief, brief here, but there's obviously this is a, uh, the, the most uh, serious pandemic uh, the world has faced in a century. And, and it's, uh, and I think it's the toughest economic uh, a situation crisis we face since the Great Depression. So this is a very, a very um, serious challenge we're all facing. Number one, number to, to get to the U.S., I think there's a wide range of outcomes, and the biggest driver here will be the ability to control the disease and uh, avoid future flare-ups, because. The economic uh, recovery of the United States is going to be determined uh, almost entirely by how quickly we can resume normal activities, normal activities in the economy, kids going back to school and so on. And th that's going to be determined to some extent by government, but to a large extent by, the, by people's ability and, 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 and willingness to, to, to go back and which will in turn be determined by, you know, how secure they feel. So, but given all that, uh, I think we should just take a minute and understand what the United States government has done. It is extraordinary. When you look at just the fiscal stimulus, you know, we've been stimulating the economy at the rate of you know, $500 billion a month when you look at the relief and the stimulus and the unemployment insurance and so on, it's been huge. 
that's like 30% of GDP. We've, we've never seen anything like this in history. It, it, it's extraordinary. And then the Fed is added $3 trillion to its balance sheet. And so, so the good news out of all of that is to the extent we can, you know, that there is not a major flare up and we can keep reopening, I think you'll, you'll see, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe 60% of the jobs that were, you know, this was a healthy economy when it was shut down. Didn't get shut down because the business and the financial system was a healthy economy. So it shouldn't be surprising if they can reopen, a lot of the jobs will come back. And so that's the good news. And they'll come back pretty quickly. Uh, the, the bad news is that some of the jobs will come back much more slowly in, 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 in travel. And there's a whole range of industries that come back more slowly in. And then some of the jobs aren't going to come back at all. Because one of the things that this uh, shutdown has done is it uh, is accelerated the process for certain businesses that would have been going out of business, uh, probably going under anyway over a period of time, like big box department stores are, are, are going to fail more quickly. And, and many, many very successful companies have learned as they operate virtually that there's a whole level of management that they don't need. And so there'll be white collar layoffs and there, there'll be, uh, and, and they have more space than they need. So there'll be, there'll be vacancies there. But I, so I think under the best of circumstances, uh, you, you can expect a lot of jobs to come back quickly, uh, unemployment to remain high for, 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 for a number of years. And so we'll be focusing on jobs coming out of this. And I expect that a big part of the recovery and a big part of the recovery should be taking this opportunity to invest in infrastructure. But I don't think that will be in the next phase. Like, like many Americans, I'm expecting another, uh, another program in, uh, before the end of July. I don't see a need to rush that because there's been so much money that's already been put out. And I, I think a lot of this will again be, be, be relief uh, that there, there will, will, to begin with, I want us to continue to see us spending any money and making any effort that can be made in the healthcare area. And people talk about the three T's, right? So the testing, tracing, and, and treatment. And before you get to a vaccine, but there you're talking about tens of billions of dollars in political will. And that will be more effective than, any, than anything else we might do. Because we can't afford to keep throwing money into the economy and doing it over and over again if we're not able to reopen. So, so I think how we reopen and there's so much discussion. Some people are arguing, you know, we we got to protect Americans' health at all costs. And others are saying we, we, we got to open. It's just not as simple as that. There's no doubt we need to open. So the question is, we need to open as safely as we possibly can, protecting Americans and protecting the most vulnerable. But in terms of what we can expect, I think we can expect that there will be more money targeted to the most vulnerable, those most in need. I hope it'll be very targeted. Uh, I think we, we can expect uh, money at the state and local level. They've lost a lot of money because of the pandemic. And I think that will be very important to the recovery. And we, we need to think about how to taper down unemployment so we facilitate opening. Right now, there's a big perverse incentive in that, uh, you know, that there's uh, m many Americans are paid more not to work than they would be if they went back to their job. And, and if they, and so how to, how to taper that down, I think there'll be a lot of, uh, a, a lot of thought given to that. Well, thank you for that. Uh, do you have any word? Uh, we can be very brief, but uh, just quickly on kind of the Fed's current stance. I think they've been exemplary. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Let me just say this. I think that there have been some real heroes in this. I think I'm going to start with Steven Mnuchin, 
the Treasury Secretary, because I think it's a, a difficult job. And to be able to maintain, you know, the support of his boss while working with Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, who were, you know, who were key figures that we worked with during the financial crisis, and we're fortunate they're all still there. And I think getting everybody to come together in record time is huge. And then I think Jay Powell and the Fed is extraordinary what they've done, extraordinary. And so you had asked about, you know, people saying, well, have they done too much and are their markets out of sync with the real economy? They've done a lot and it's been a huge advantage because, you know, they've, that's really limited the number of business failures that the markets are so strong, any company with a double B credit or better can go to the public market and many others will be able to go to banks. And so the private sector is, 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 is doing a really good job and the, the financial system and, and, and keeping a, a, a companies afloat. So again, I give, and, uh, I, I give uh, Jay and the Fed a lot of credit for what they've been doing. Thank you for that. Well. Uh I have two more questions for you if you have time. Um, but the first is uh, that um, the Fed has had to go far beyond the Bernanke playbook from 2008 and 2009. Uh, and a lot, a lot of that is because of, in my view, financial leverage emanating from the non-banks. So you, Tim, Ben had to deal with the banks but there seems to be a lot of leverage in, in non-banks. And I was wondering if, the, if you felt the U.S. now needs to better address the non-banks, um, their activities, and the leverage in the financial system. And I, I remember in Treasury, you always used to refer to leverage as Tinder. I guess in, a decade ago, that wasn't a dating app. Um, so we should say kindling, perhaps. But um, how do you think about that right now? Yeah, well, uh, Mark, first of all, this, the leverage outside of the banking system was also a major cause of the problem in 2008. If, if, if you look at the tri-party repo system, if you look at uh, money market funds, I mean, one of the biggest problems we had was a, a whole lot of credit was flowing outside of the, the, the banking system. But the huge difference was that because in 2008, the immediate problem started in the banks, that uh, we weren't, and it didn't spread to the real economy, to Main Street. We had to get to the brink before we got Congress to act because because they, they didn't want to help the arsonists, right? They looked at the bank as the arsonists that were starting the fire with the, with, with, with the kindling, right? But uh, they, they had to see it was getting to Main Street before they would act. And one of the, so, so this time, because the banks were very healthy when this hit, uh, no one could blame the banks. And it hit Main Street right between the eyes. But this would have been another banking crisis. You remember in mid-March, banks were dropping, you know, getting out of assets. And, uh, and this could have spread very quickly and become a financial crisis. But what uh, Mnuchin did working with Pelosi and, uh, and with Mitch McConnell was dusted off some of the tools we'd used before. And they gave the government the, uh, the power to, to guarantee bank liabilities as we used it in, in 2008. And, you know, the, uh, you know, $500 billion in exchange stabilization funds. So what they did was they dusted off the tools that we used. And so many of the tools that are being used by the Fed were ones that were developed and, and, and Treasury and the Fed in, in 2008, which, which I think has been, uh, which, which has made a difference. But to your, to your specific question, yes, we have too much debt outside of the banking system. We did in 2008, because in 2008, what you saw was, you know, 
households had developed, uh, the household debt had gone up so much over the preceding 10 years that, uh, that homeowners were borrowing to, to, to maintain a standard of living that they couldn't afford. So you saw household borrowing go way up. And now, even though households may have had somewhat less debt, our whole system is, uh, is filled with debt. And I think to, to get at that, you really have to, it's a much longer and deeper discussion because in the United States of America, we encourage borrowing. Interest is deductible. We discourage savings. You know, the interest that someone earns on their savings account, you pay a tax on. We're the only major nation in the world that doesn't have a national consumption tax. You know, so, so there's a lot of things that we do to uh, incentivize debt in the United States of America. Well, thank you. Well, let me, let me wrap up and totally shift gears. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that you're a, a deeply committed environmentalist. Um, most don't know this, but at Treasury, uh, they think of you as the person who fought the, the financial crisis, but you also sought to use the dialogue with China and the international financial institutions to promote a healthier global environment. And you and uh, Dave McCormick uh, set up an environmental unit in international affairs, which became a mini think tank for uh, the government, if I recall. A uh, very proud achievement. But uh, any thoughts for us on the prospects for a green recovery in the US and around the world? And thoughts on what can be done to leave us today? Yeah, well, Mark, you know, th this pandemic is. I'm not going to minimize the crisis. It's the most serious one since the Great Depression. But more important than the crisis are, is going to be the policies that come out of the crisis because they're going to determine the health of our planet and the prosperity of, of, of future generations in, in the United States and around the world. And, um, you know, I, I think there's very little doubt that if we're looking at major risks to our world. You would have to put climate change as being the most certain risk. And here I'm talking about a risk not only to economic security, national security, global stability, and the health of, of the people that inhabit the world and, and, and our planet itself. So this is extraordinarily important, number one. Number two, I do believe, and I believe we are going to see infrastructure uh, uh, investing as a, uh, as a recovery vehicle, not only in the US, but around the world. And you know, I, I'm hoping that in the US, we have an infrastructure uh, re recovery plan that's on, uh, you know, uh, on technologies in the future, a big, a, a big push in uh, AI and advanced manufacturing, a big push in, in digital software communications and so on, and, and on uh, green uh, infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, which I think is going to be very important. Um, and you know, the, the, there's been a study, a, a very good study th that's come out of Oxford University that analyzed 800 uh, infrastructure stimulus programs coming out of 2008 right up to the present. And they found that green spending promotes, not only is it a long-term positive, but it, it leads to more jobs quicker and uh, higher economic return th than, than other plans. Now, it's pretty certain you're going to see this being big in Europe because they've, you know, the European, the EU has made it very clear that climate change is going to be at the center of their uh, post pandemic uh, development uh, initiatives. And we've seen a whole series of things announced in China. I think in the US, uh, we're definitely going to see a lot of things done at, at, at the state and local level. As to whether we do something at the national level, I think that's going to, to a large extent depend on what happens in the election on November 3rd. Well, thank you for that.
Uh, Hank Paulson, the 74th Secretary of the Treasury, one of the most distinguished uh, figures in the economic and financial history of the United States. Thank you for joining us today for a fantastic discussion. Mark, thank you very much and uh, great to see you again.